את גדי לא צריך להציג, אז אני לא מציג אותו. <laughs> גדי. שלום לכולם, מה שלומכם? שמח לדבר איתכם היום, ועכשיו אני אעבור לאנגלית, סתם כי בא לי. היי גאיז, איך אתם עושים? I'm going to talk, obviously, wow, who would have guessed about cyber counterintelligence? I, I actually thought, grammatically, a lot. Am I going to talk about cyber counterintelligence or counter cyber intelligence? It's an, in, it's an interesting distinction. I still haven't made up my mind completely, but think about it. I believe in an attacker-based approach, and that's what I'm going to present. Um, one guy who has been instrumental the past couple of years working on this methodology is Ron Orell. He's not here today. Um, Let's get to it. So me, very, very quickly. I'm chairman of the board of the Israeli CERT. I am the founding chairman of the Cyber Threat Intelligence Alliance. I've done a lot of things, including I'm here at the Sadna, Yuval Neyman workshop at Tel Aviv University. I'm a dance teacher, West Coast Swing, believe it or not. Come on. Uh, thank you, you didn't have to. Um, most recently, I left Kaspersky Lab, where I've been vice president of cybersecurity strategy, and so on and so forth. I've been in this space for a while. Um, <laughs> so I believe, right off, off the top of getting started, there is an inherent attacker advantage. And I break it down into three main categories you can build your own. Number one, the attacker is maneuverable. The attacker can choose where it will attack from, how it will attack, when it will attack, and where the objective of the attack. You can actually look at it a little, a little bit differently. Where the attacker will attack from, where will it attack through, when will it attack, and how will it attack. The idea of maneuverability online has been boggling my mind for years, ever since I've been to Estonia when they got attacked in 2007. What's maneuverability online? If we have a horse, can we go faster and flunk a, a troop um, um, of uh, simple soldiers? That makes no sense. Everything connects to everything else. There has to be a way to measure this. This talk is not as technical as the other talks. It comes to try and make security management, security strategy, all of these different types of disciplines more quantitative which is why it's in this track. I've given this talk before at the HoneyNut project and some other types of conferences, and I hope you'll enjoy it because that's where we're coming from. How can we quantify the unquantifiable? So, number one, maneuverable. Got that, right? Number two, dynamic. Dynamic for me, as defined in this talk, is self-testable. Even if you have zero intelligence before your operation, you go out and attack your objective thousands of times, there is no context to know it's you between these different attempts, and until you mapped out all the defenses and all the controls of your opponent. That's a power the attacker has, the defense does not. Or put another way, if, you're not right, if you want to write your malware, you can test it against all known antiviruses. Right? Makes sense. At that point, unless you're the Chinese, the Chinese will use <laughs> VirusTotal as the development platform, and you can look at their entire history of development, and that's pretty cool. So, self-testable. If you look at that and combine it together with maneuverable, it's almost NP-complete. They're extremely powerful, while we are very static. We are very passive. We're waiting for them to come to us, and then we're screwed. Just now, JP Morgan, right? Every week we discover another huge organization that got hacked, or got pwned, or whatever language you want to use. $250 million spent annually on security. You can argue they spent it wrong, but when it comes down to it, we failed. A few years ago, we used to be security officers, kabatim, with knives between our teeth and saying, nobody comes in, high walls on the outside. Then we started saying, we'll be measured by how we respond when something actually happens. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, there was a major change. People started saying, assume compromise. Somebody's already inside. That changed everything. Reality and perception came together, and we started understanding we are failing. They're already inside, and this is why, in my view, this inherent advantage, which the last one is, the attacker is considered cooler. You can say they have better capabilities, but when it comes down to it, the minute you go into defensive, or the defensive side, the minute you're a defender, you become a CPA. You start looking at budgets, Excel sheets, right? best practices, that's what you do in life. The other side is agile. They can change technologies. They can change different angles of attack. They can plan the operations in many, many different ways. And they're cooler. They're showing up big brother. This by itself, if you're a Romanian kid, just downloading tools off the internet, you have more capabilities inherently than most organizations out there. All this together is to show the attacker is dynamic, the attacker is powerful, 
the attacker is stronger than the defender. The defender is simply not. In military terms, this is what I define as asymmetry because asymmetry is a buzzword. And I had to get it out, this out there, talking about dynamics, maneuverability, and cooler. Let's move on. So what do we do about this? Mostly, we talk about attacks. We look for the payload. We look for the packet. We look for another log line somewhere. Can we identify that the degree in the room just went up half, half a degree more in temperature? The temperature in the room just went up. Is that a real person? Is it an attacker? We have so much noise. I just spoke to a huge organization on the phone. They have hundreds of people in their security operations center alone looking at logs all day long, and they have only one guy responding to incidents. <laughs> it's insane. There is a huge amount of noise out there in how we do things. So it's time to change what we do. And we need to do counterintelligence. And that comes down to what we're going to talk about today, which is situational awareness and attacker detection. If you look at counterintelligence, there are ba the basics. Asset protection, you know, locks on the doors, policies, monitoring. But when it comes down to it, if you do best practices, good practices in cybersecurity, you will make the attacker's lives more difficult. Every layer they have to go through makes their lives more difficult, but it's still not defending against espionage. We need to do something extra. So quickly discussing the cyber kill chain, you can Google it on your own, but the cyber kill chain is a concept made famous by Lockheed Martin, but it's been around for a very long time, still giving them credit, which says every single attack out there that's APT type can be mapped. The attacker will go through third and what I would like to call essential path. These paths are something attackers will have to go through. This is from the military. If you go on a hill and you want to conquer it, there are certain paths you can go on uh, that will make sense to you. If you wait there, you can catch the attacker. You can see them doing what they're doing. So the cyber kill chain tries to give you this by looking at reconnaissance, weaponization, delivery, exploitation, installation, command control, actions and objective which matters to me most. The cyber kill chain is not good enough for me, but still it's pretty insanely cool. It increases situational awareness. It's a model by which to manage monitoring. It connects the dots between seemingly unrelated events, but it's not good enough. It's about classic controls and attacks. So let's talk about deception, which is a key word here. Deception operations can be a new layer of controls for the organization. So basic truth. We can't always detect individual attacks. There are new types of attacks every day. The attacker objectives are discernible. So what can we do about it? Examples. If you want to protect an area and you surround it with CCTV cameras all around, one of the cameras is broken or its angle is slightly off. If somebody tries to enter that area through that hole, that's an attacker. That's solid. Period. We caught them. That's deception. So here are some scenarios. I want to go into a methodology of how this should be done correctly. Because any tool you use, say a firewall, you throw it on a network and you don't have a network map, you don't have a methodology to how to use it on how to use it correctly, it's useless. But let's quickly, just to get the juices running, go through some scenarios for tools. So an APT is in your network attempting to find higher privileged computers and users by network scanning. We'll try to detect the scan or the spread. I'm saying, no, create fake computers. If you try to scan, I want to answer for fake computers. If somebody answers back, bam, we got to get the attacker. Next, an APT attempts to access your organization's crown jewels. Access control, authentication, authorization, monitoring. I'm saying, create a fake safe. Next. You can't do that. Let's do something else. An APT is attempting to discover an entry point to your organization by external network sharing. Scanning, sorry. Uh, firewalls, IDSs, DMZs. Let's just create a fake entry point. An APT is attempting to discover an entry point to your organization by accessing a current bot infection. We don't need advanced technologies to get in. Not always. Covertness is important. But we might just use commo sorry, commodity tools. If I have bots in my organization, that's one of the first things reconnaissance is going to look for to get into my network. I want to control that space and create my own bot. Somebody comes in, I got them. An APT in your network is trying to determine domain admin password through pass the hash technology. You can do event type 3 and 10 monitoring. You can flush and restart computers. But I want to create a fake domain admin account. If somebody uses it, that's pretty obvious, right? Next, an attacker is mapping your network. We can use uh, different types of ne network uh, segmentation, whatever it is. But why not create fake nodes or entire fake networks? If an attacker cannot know 
at each stage along the operation, if they are on a real network, a real computer, a real share, a real anything, that changes how operations are planned. There are many, many different ways, maktagim, if you like, in Hebrew, on how operations are planned. But there is only one rule. Don't get caught. Or if you're the Chinese, what can you do until you get caught? Right? <laughs> so if I change that risk, even slightly, and the attacker will think twice before they attack me, that's deterrence. If they know I'm already there, that's great. They need to be careful. They need to be careful to determine if this is a decoy, if this is a misdirection, if this is the redirect, if this is any type of the immense amount of tools out there in the deception tool set. It's not just about, say, honeypots, for example. They will go slower. They go slower, I have more chances of catching them. And that's great. I just changed the dynamics. I am making the fence dynamic. I am changing the way their risk, rather than cost, in operation planning works. So let's go for honeypots, which are, I got to tell you right now, honeypots are a specific, specific private case of what deception is. If you go for honeypots, you will not be able to sell them. That's number one. Everybody will be scared of you. It's like a petri dish. Nobody wants to touch it. Get it away from it, right? But even if you just use honeypots, just this type of decoy, you need to assess if it's effective. You need to assess how it's going to work. There are many different stages of doing this. We're going to skip over them. But I would say that this goes from strategy. What do you want to achieve? A new layer of controls to get the Trojan horse from the attacker so you can immunize yourself against it rather than the latest report which took six months to generate, six months before that to work on, six months before that to detect, that's a year and a half. We're working a year and a half late, even at the top edge of technology. So we go down to architecture. Where do we want to wait? Essential path where the attacker can follow. We go down to the actual technology, the tactical, delay, deny, decay, all of these things. This is from the John Doctrine for Information Operations of Saints changed my mind, now I believe targeting is more apt, but that's beside the point. So honeypots, just honeypots, even though there are side issue here, they focus us. And they must not be treated as a tool, but rather as a methodology on how we approach a subject. The point of this, if you want to abstract it all, take a step back. Forget the technology, forget the tactics, is that the attacker has a methodology of himself or herself or themselves. They work by certain rules. We want to castle them. They go into the network. They have an access point. At some point along the line, they find their objective. Everything changes from that point. My goal is to show them their objective. And when they see it, castle them, just like in chess, or double them, if you like to use different terminology, to my decoy or to the redirection point or whatever else you want to call them, that's one possible strategy of using this type of technology. Now, there are some implementation issues. You could cover methodological holes. You don't necessarily need to create an entire new layer of control. Some organizations will say, we're not mature enough. You can try and concentrate on your crown jewels. Don't say anything. You could tear it. You could create tripwires. The possibilities are endless once you go methodological, strategic, rather than just concentrating on a specific tool. Once you put this into your business planning and into your organizational strategy. So again, honeypots, I know I'm reiterating, not the technology, a methodology. Now, it's a philosophy. Deception and intelligence are just, not just new controls. They change how security actually works. They've always been stronger, agile, dynamic. Well, it's time to make defense maneuverable. It's time to change the way we do things. It's time to say, no, assume compromise is not good enough. But right now, if we have this huge hole, I was sitting at the CISO conference in Berlin for all the CISOs in Europe. And every single CISO who came on stage said 250 days average until we discover an attack on our networks. That's the average. The median is something different because the worst monthly, for example, is found is 2,300 days. When it is found, so first of all, they go through our defenses. Number two, it's not found. And number three, when we do find it, 67% of the cases, it's not even by us. It's by Brian Krebs or by the FBI or some vendor. This is showing us we failed in how we do security today, and we need to start thinking differently. Are current controls important? Yes. But we need to start acting actively. There is a quote I really like which is not in this presentation, but it anyway. It's my own personal translation from ancient Italian. 
I, am, I don't know ancient Italian. Machiavelli wrote a book, not just the prince, he wrote Art of War. Not Sun Tzu is the Chinese guy. And he has one quote I really like. If your enemy knows your defenses and you don't change them, you're a punk. That's, in my view, just summarizes, it summarizes the essence of what we've been doing wrong. So making defense maneuverable, can we do this? Yes. We need to become mature enough in security. We need to think differently. But also, we need to test for ourselves and consult a lawyer. I am not a lawyer. This is important to say right now in case anybody ever decides to sue me. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time.